um, and I'm just going to kick it right off. So um, many of you, like me, have probably um, experienced this over the last couple of years where you showed up at a mass individual testing site and you get a nasal pharyngeal swab or a mid-terminate swab collected and then were tested probably for SARS-CoV-2. Well, a subset of those samples also would have been sent out to be sequenced. Um, but as we've kind of moved into the more endemic phase of the pandemic, um, most testing is occurring using rapid antigen tests in, the, in your home. And so those samples, likely, you're, you run your test, you chuck it in the trash. So we've lost a lot of the resolution for sequencing variants of SARS-CoV-2 in general as we've kind of moved into this more endemic phase. And so we don't necessarily know what's happening in the broader population because those samples that are being sequenced are typically coming from the healthcare setting and generally quite sick individuals. So one way to sort of bridge this gap in sequencing surveillance is to use anonymous pooled testing, such as environmental surveillance. And many of you may be familiar with wastewater sampling, because that's been um, widely published over the last year or so for looking at sequencing of these variants. But what I'm going to talk about today is air sampling, because the lab that I'm in, Dr. Dave O'Connor's lab at UW-Madison, has really been trying to see um, how effective this could be as a strategy for getting some more broad community surveillance. And so why might we consider indoor air sampling? As I mentioned before, this could um, fill the role of um, bridging those surveillance gaps, so more generalizable to the general population, sort of uh, variant um, tracking. Um, and you can imagine a situation where you might deploy air samplers in schools and you might get a snapshot in time of what kinds of viruses, not even just SARS-CoV-2, but other viruses as well, might be circulating in the community. There are also places where an outbreak of a viral infection would be really high consequence, so such as a long-term care facility, where you might have a lot more morbidity and mortality than you would have in the population in general. And so this could be useful for identifying an outbreak early, potentially, and then um, starting mitigation strategies to prevent it from spreading in a really uh, at-risk population. Another potential use for Air sampling could be in transit hubs to sort of look at what might be coming into and out of a region. And just here on the far, well, I guess it's left, but right if you're looking at it, is a Thermo Fisher aerosol sense machine. And this is um, what we use to generate the data that I'm going to talk about today. Um, to collect samples, you insert a cartridge that contains two substrates, and air flows over those substrates for the period of time that you run the sampler, and then you recover them and elute your sample. So how are we detecting viral metagenomics in air samples? So there are a couple different strategies for doing this. There's a targeted strategy where you might use a target capture hybridization followed by sequencing, or you might use a multiplex assay such as a multiplex PCR. But for those strategies, you really need to know going in what you want to look for in your sample. So you have to design the assay to detect what you want it to find. But you're not going to find things that you're not looking for. So one of the other options is to use unbiased sequencing, which is what I'm going to talk about today, and it tends to be less sensitive than a targeted strategy, but it has been rapidly improving. So one of the first strategies that we've been using in our lab for unbiased sequencing in air samples is sequence-independent single primer amplification, and many of you were probably at the morning um, lightning talks, and Maria talked about this strategy as well. Um, it does have its downsides because it's less sensitive than targeted methods because you will amplify anything in your sample, but the way we use it is we use a primer that has a random nonomer on the end, which, general, which we undergo binding with the RNA in our samples, then we uh, generate cDNA, and then we amplify that cDNA before pushing it into sequencing. <clears throat> so this is just an example of our CISPA sample protocol pipeline, and generally our hands-on time with this is about six hours. So we isolate our viral nucleic acid, we do a DNA digestion, we do an RNA clean and concentrate, do the CISPA protocol, and then we prep all of our samples with the native barcoding kit, and then typically have sequenced on a MNI and Mark 1C for about 72 hours. And this is an example of some of the data that we've generated using this method. So this is actually available on MedArchive. Um, the first authors are Nick Miner and Mitchell Ramuda. They're a research specialist and a graduate student 
former graduate student from the lab. This was recently accepted for publication at Scientific Reports, if you're interested in more details. But we deployed air samplers in several congregate settings, several different types. So we had an air sampler at a brew pub. We had an air sampler at a university coffee shop. We had some in K-12 schools, a preschool, and an SDI clinic. And we detected a number of different viruses using metagenomic sequencing. So this included influenza viruses, SARS-CoV-2, as we might expect, RSV, and seasonal coronaviruses, among others. And it was really interesting because the pattern of viruses that we detected in these different congregate settings kind of fit along with the type of setting that we had the air sampler deployed in. For example, in the preschool, we tended to detect a lot of viruses that you might expect to find in young children who you know, stick their hands in their mouths and then touch everything. Um, so it was really reassuring, and it was really cool to see that we could pick up a variety of different viruses, even some that weren't necessarily respiratory viruses, in our air sample data. So another method that we've been using for our sample prep more recently is RapidSmart 9N, and this is described by Nick Lohman and Josh Quick's groups, who are well known to the nanopore community. Um, basically, it applies random priming to SmartSeq technology, and so much like CISPA, you have a primer that has a random nonomer, so it'll bind any RNAs in your sample. You also generate cDNA by this method, but then when we go into the amplification step, we actually use the Rapid PCR barcoding kit, and it actually adds the barcodes in the amplification step. So it's been a big time saver for us. And our hands-on time is actually a lot less. You still have pretty long amplifications on the thermocyclers. But during that time when you have that long amplification, you can actually go back into the lab, prep a whole other set of samples, and get them ready to go as well. So it has been, in our hands, a, an excellent time saver. So I'm going to now describe quickly um, a household outbreak that occurred, a SARS-CoV-2 outbreak that occurred in the home of a lab member and their family, um, where we used Rapid Smart 9N to generate sequencing samples um, that we then nanopore sequenced to identify the variant that caused the outbreak. So in this particular household outbreak, individual one, shown in blue, started to feel ill, felt ill for about a week, but was testing negative by rapid antigen tests for that whole period of time. Individual two, shown in green, began feeling ill, tested positive by rapid antigen tests. At that time, individual one retested and was also positive for SARS-CoV-2, and then within a few days, the third individual in the household also tested positive. So at the time that those first two individuals, one and two, tested positive by rapid antigen test, we actually deployed three aerosol sense air samplers in the residence, one on the first floor, two on the second floor. The circles here are just showing the approximate square footage radius that each of those samplers is designed to cover. Um, and we actually collected cartridges from these samplers over a range of time periods. Some of them were collected every couple hours. Some of them were collected over a day or so. But really what we did for our metagenomic sequencing experiments is we waited till we had PCR data for all of these. So we used the N1, N2 assay by CDC um, in our lab. And we picked samples that had CTs less than 30 because we have our greatest sequencing success with those samples. And then we sequenced a bunch of those CT less than 30 samples. So that's like, um, in our hands, less than 30 is like hundreds of thousands to tens of thousands of um, N1, N2 copies. Um, and although a lot of the samples sequenced, this one particular sample sequenced really well from early on in the outbreak, and we actually got good coverage for our unbiased sequencing of the whole SARS-CoV-2 genome. And in this instance, we were actually able to identify the variant, a subvariant of Omicron that caused the household outbreak. It was XBB.1.16.2, which was frequently um, found in surveillance samples from a number of regions in the US at the time. So it wasn't surprising, because this was April of this year. But it just goes to show that if you have reasonably good uh, sequencing from air samples, you can actually identify a variant that's causing an outbreak. So that could be useful even if you're looking at a totally different pathogen, if you expect to see a lot of genetic variation for that pathogen. And then also, if you remember, um, individual one in the household outbreak was sick prior to um, testing positive for SARS-CoV-2 for more than a week. Um, and we actually, because we didn't use targeted sequencing here, because we used the unbiased method, we were actually able to identify another respiratory virus that was also circulating in the household. And it was identified as RSVB, which is coincident with the individual's illness prior to testing positive for SARS-CoV-2. So we actually identified a potential pre-infection or co-infection occurring within this household outbreak. So now I just want to summarize, and I 
Um, we th feel that air sampling can help fill the gaps in community surveillance efforts, and using this on biased approach is pretty flexible, although it does come with a big caveat in that your viral nucleic acid is always going to be competing with all of the other stuff you're picking up in these samples. So these samples tend to be pretty dirty. They're not clean like clinical samples from a sick individual. There's lots of bacteria and host in them as well. So that is one of the main caveats with this method. And with that, I just want to acknowledge everybody that's been involved in this um, work, which especially people in the DHO lab, the graduate students, and the research specialists that have spent a lot of time teaching people how to run the air samplers and how to collect the data and just really helping with deployment. And also all of our sites that allowed us to place samplers, which can be kind of loud. So the fact that they tolerate us is, is a big help to this study. Thank you.